there, I'm Alison Hills, one of the partners in the Pensions and Employee Benefits team at Red Lake Bell. I'm going to talk to you about member complaints and a particular Pensions Ombudsman complaint today. The careful management of pension schemes and taking advice from professional advisors at the appropriate time will help to minimise complaints. Indeed, we pride ourselves in supporting our clients on an ongoing basis to help reduce the risk of complaints arising. However, despite best efforts, it is still possible for complaints to arise. In terms of the process of dealing with complaints, they are likely to progress through the following stages. First of all, an informal complaint will invariably be made either to the trustees or possibly the employer. Where the complainant remains dissatisfied, they will escalate that through the internal dispute resolution procedure, an IDRP, which trustees of occupational pension schemes are required to have in place. Where that isn't dealt with satisfactorily, the matter can be escalated to the pensions ombudsman and thereafter it can be escalated to the court. Now it is worth noting that pensions ombudsman decisions can only be appealed to the courts on a point of law. It is important that schemes have an up-to-date IDRP which takes account of the prescribed requirements. If any trustees are concerned that their IDRP is out of date and or fail to comply with the current requirements, we can assist with reviewing the document and helping to suggest some pragmatic improvements. When dealing with an IDRP, we recommend the involvement of the appropriate professional advisors to increase the chances of nipping the complaint in the bud wherever possible. Where a beneficiary has completed the scheme's IDRP but remains dissatisfied with the results of it, then as mentioned earlier, they have the opportunity to escalate their complaint via the pensions ombudsman. The standard timescale for escalating complaint to the ombudsman is three years from the relevant event occurring or three years of the complainant becoming aware of that event. The ombudsman offers an early resolution service which aims to resolve matters on an informal basis as quickly as possible. Where that is unsuccessful or indeed inappropriate, the pensions ombudsman's formal adjudication service will need to be used. Employers and trustees should try to resolve complaints as early as possible, as the involvement of the pensions ombudsman can result in significant cost, significant time being spent on the matter, and also potential reputational damage. The pensions ombudsman decision I'm going to focus on today concerns an area which I'm often asked about by trustee clients. How much information do they need to provide to members and beneficiaries? There are, of course, requirements laid down in the disclosure regulations which need to be considered and adhered to in relation to the provision of information and documents. And trustees are often, quite rightly, concerned about giving so much information that they fall foul of the prohibition on providing members and other beneficiaries with financial advice, which is a regulated activity. Where the line falls in relation to provision of information will often need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But a recent pensions ombudsman case cast some helpful light on certain situations. The complaint I'm going to talk about has the reference number 17639 and it was brought by the estate of the late Mr R. In this case, the member, being Mr R, contacted the scheme administrator to explain to them that he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He wanted to seek details of the options available. The scheme administrator responded in writing and provided details of two retirement options, stating that in each case, the widow's pension would be in the region of £7,000 per annum. The scheme administrator included a comment that he could potentially commute his benefits for serious ill health if his life expectancy was less than 12 months, and said that further information and evidence of this would be necessary before they could process such a request. Unfortunately, Mr R did not respond and actually died four months later. Following his death and also a change of scheme administrator, Mr R's wife was informed that her pension entitlement as a widow was in the region of £5,500 per annum. Mrs R queried why her entitlement was so much lower, especially when there was no lump sum payable. The scheme administrator explained that her entitlement as a, to a widow's pension was lower as a result of her husband dying as a deferred member, as opposed to dying as a pensioner. Mrs R issued a complaint to the trustees regarding her lower pension entitlement and said that the scheme administrators had failed to properly inform Mr R of his full range of options. 
In particular, Mr R had not understood the severe impact on his widow's pension of failing to commence receipt of his benefits. Mrs R also complained that the trustees had not recommended to Mr R that he seek independent financial advice and that this was not a standard request for information as he had explained he was terminally ill. The trustees response in summary was that Mr R's request had been properly dealt with and the scheme administrator had provided the necessary and appropriate information. Mrs R remaining dissatisfied escalated the matter to the Ombudsman. Her concerns included the fact that the scheme administrator had not clearly explained what the position would be if her husband failed to apply for retirement and died as a deferred member. She claims that her and her husband had assumed that the options relating to lump sum and widow's pension would remain unchanged following his death, irrespective of whether he had commenced receipt of his benefits before that time. She claimed that if Mr R had understood the consequences of taking their action, then he certainly would have applied to commence receipt of his benefits without delay. Now, the Ombudsman upheld the complaint on the following grounds. Firstly, the trustees had not followed up on the options letter to make sure that Mr R had received it. Secondly, the trustees had failed to take adequate measures to ensure that Mr R understood the significance of the options outlined in the letter. In particular, they did not explain that the benefits payable to his widow would be significantly lower if he did not access his scheme benefits before death. Now, this is a very interesting decision, as whilst it does clearly turn on the facts, it indicates that there is a significant burden on the trustees to, firstly, ensure communications are received by members and in certain circumstances to follow up with the members if they do not receive a response. Secondly, to encourage members to seek financial advice when making any retirement decisions, not just the decision to transfer where there are already statutory requirements in relation to taking independent financial advice. And thirdly, to ensure that members understand the significance of the options available to them and the consequences of their decisions, or as in this case, the failure to take any action. This case was clearly one where time was short but there are many circumstances where parallels could be drawn and trustees could be expected to live up to these significant expectations. If you have any questions about this decision or are dealing with a member complaint and need help, please do get in touch with us. We might just be able to help you avoid the costly escalation of a complaint. Thank you very much.